Hello there. So welcome to our lecture for Wednesday, the 28th of October. And we've been looking at chapter seven on the states of matter and gas laws. Just a quick run over the three states of matter, expanding on what we had talked about briefly in chapter one. So we said that those three states of matter for most chemicals begin with a solid at low temperature. Oh. You can't hear me, Haley? Right, who does hear me and who doesn't? Harrison said he did. Alexei, Jared, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So Haley, it must be something at your end because everyone else is hearing me just now. Um, have you switched your um, sound on? Is your headphones switched in if you're using headphones? There's definitely sound coming out from my end, apparently. Okay. Fingers crossed. We... Okay, we're good. Right. That's all right. It's always worthwhile making sure everybody's on board. So starting with the uh, at low temperature, because that's when molecules have less kinetic energy. And so they can't resist those forces of attraction that we were talking about on Monday, those intermolecular bonding forces. And they hold the molecules tightly together and we get the most ordered state of matter, the solid state where we might have molecules all pointing in the same direction, or maybe they're organized into very specific layers. There's some form of order which gives us long range order. So we can pick out molecules at very regular points. And as temperature rises, the molecules gain in kinetic energy, start to twist and move around. And we eventually reach a point at the melting temperature which we see here, and the melting temperature where the molecules now have enough energy to resist those forces of attraction and start moving around and sliding around each other, taking us to the liquid state. Notice that that transition from a solid to a liquid is a flat line. The overall temperature of the solution or body doesn't change until every last molecule has melted into the liquid state. And so this is happening as the molecules are absorbing energy uh, from the surroundings. And so we sometimes refer to uh, melting as a endothermic process because those chemicals are absorbing the energy. It's giving them the energy to start moving around. As we continue to raise temperature in the liquid state, the molecules are more random moving around, but they're still pretty tightly packed together we know that from taking a syringe full of liquid, you can't push the syringe down and cut the amount, uh, the volume of the liquid down. So we've got a constant volume in the liquid phase. So it's telling us that the molecules are still tightly packed together. And as temperature rises, we'll eventually reach that melting temperature, oh, sorry, that boiling temperature, I beg your pardon, a boiling temperature where those liquid molecules convert into gas molecules. And again, in that transition between liquid and gas during the boiling temperature, the temperature is static. Okay, it's a flat line. We don't see temperature rise until every last molecule is transformed from the liquid to the gas state. And so during that boiling point process, the chemicals are again absorbing energy and so the boiling of a liquid into a gas is also an endothermic process. So in the gas state, we have the most random state of matter. And we can start cooling that gas back down again on the other side. As the gas cools, we eventually reach the what we now call the condensation point, like a, a liquid condensing on a cold surface like a window. We've got this condensation point, 
where those gas molecules turn back into a liquid. And we can see again, normally that transition is static. We don't see the temperature drop any further until every last molecule has transformed from a gas back into a liquid. And so that condensation point, that transition is referred to as an exothermic process because the molecules are losing energy as a turn from a gas into a liquid. Okay, the liquid continues to cool until we reach what we call now the freezing point as the molecules turn from a liquid back into a solid. Again, static, plateaued temperature until the process is complete. Because the molecules are losing energy, we again refer to it as an exothermic process. Now, when we get that solid back after cooling, uh, we will either get a crystalline or an amorphous solid. And it depends on how quickly the liquid is being cooled. Think of it of like trying to build a brick wall with your hands. If you're given the time and, uh, to do this, you can make a good job of neatly packing all the bricks on top of each other to make a good wall. But if you have been rushed, if you have limited time and you have to just slap the bricks on top without adjusting them and putting them exactly in place, then the wall is going to be crooked. And again, it's rather like the molecules aligning with each other in a very crooked way. And so if we, we rush it, if the molecules don't have enough time, although they will freeze into a solid, it's what we call an amorphous solid with the bricks, almost as if we took a pile of bricks, threw them up in the air, and then just left them where they landed. They're packed tightly together, but they're kind of crisscrossing and not efficiently packed the way we would like to see. However, if we do take time and we allow the liquid to cool slowly into the solid state, they've got time to neatly pack on top of each other, like an efficient packing of a wall, and we say the solid is a crystalline solid. That's when we see shiny crystals. Because the molecules are packed and arrayed in a very particular order, the light diffracts off the molecules at the same time, producing that shine and that luster of a crystalline substance. Still hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm getting these weird beeps going on in my headphones. So sometimes that could mean my headphones are shutting down for some reason. But they are switched on today. Okay. So we eventually, or now, we want to talk exclusively about that last most random state of matter, the gas state. So we take a body of gas. We've got molecules whizzing about at high speed often speeds greater than 3,000 miles per hour. And every time they collide with a surface, they create force. Now, if we measure the specific area that those molecules are colliding off, that gives us a measurement of pressure. So the pressure increases as the force increases or as the area that the molecules are bouncing off decreases if that force becomes more concentrated on a smaller space. And we are used to having uh, the pressure of a gas around us all the time because we've got the air pressure around us. You think about the air with oxygen, nitrogen gas, and carbon dioxide primarily. Those molecules are bouncing around us all the time. And the force of gravity pushes the air down onto the surface of the planet, creating this atmospheric pressure. Now we can measure that atmospheric pressure uh, with something called a manometer. And it works out at sea level to be about 760 millimeters of mercury pressure. Literally, if you take a, a column of mercury and you force air onto the mercury on one side, it will push the mercury a total of 760 millimeters. So that's what we normally call one atmosphere, 760 millimeters of pressure we can convert from atmospheres into millimeters of mercury by taking the atmospheric value and multiplying by 760. 
or take their value in millimeters and convert into atmospheres by dividing by 760. We sometimes call the units to air of millimeter pressure tors after the Italian chemist who first discovered this. And in Europe, they also talk about Pascals, but this is the last time I'm going to mention Pascals. Um, it's just something that's not used really all that much in America. So we'll talk about millimeters of mercury, we'll talk about pa um, atmospheres of pressure, but we won't be talking about Pascals. Now, when it comes to measuring the pressure of a gas like air, we can take a body of gas on two sides of the manometer, and then the, the gas on one side is vacuumed out. So now that body of mercury, that liquid mercury, is only having force or pressure exerted on it from one side, as we look at the picture on the right. And so that pressure on one side pushes the mercury down and up the other side. As we look at the difference between the mercury levels, that gives, a, gives us a measurement of the force of the pressure being generated by that gas. Usually a manometer measures in centimeters rather than millimeters. If it was in millimeters, then we'd have to make a much bigger uh, machine. Okay. So this is how we came up with the value of 760 millimeters of mercury pressure for air. Now, once we had air as a standard of 760 millimeters, we could tweak our design a little bit and just put the unknown gas on one side and then the air on the other side. Two gases pushing down on the column of mercury, but we know that the air for its part is pushing down on the mercury with a force of 760 millimeters of mercury pressure. Okay, so there's the air from its side pushing down on the column of mercury, the unknown gas also pushing down. And so now when we look at that difference in the, the column of mercury, that difference is a measure of how much extra force one of the two gases is generating. And we know that the force of air is exactly one atmosphere, 760 millimeters of mercury pressure. So as that mercury column moves, we see that the unknown gas is exerting more pressure because the column is moving away from the, uh, the unknown gas. And it's a measurement of 42 centimeters, which is of course, 420 millimeters. So that unknown gas is exerting 420 millimeters more pressure than the air. If they were exerting the same amount of pressure, that our mercury levels would still be even. So 420 millimeters more for the unknown gas, divided by 760, that converts it into atmospheres. And so the unknown gas is exerting 0.552 atmospheres more pressure than the body of air, because air exerts one atmosphere of pressure and the unknown gas is exerting 0.552 atmospheres more, the unknown gas must be exerting 1.552 atmospheres of pressure. One atmosphere is a standard for air. The mercury levels tell us how much more or less the gas is exerting in terms of pressure compared to the air, and so we can work out the gas pressure. We look at a second example. Again in the manometer. This time it's the air which is exerting more pressure. We know it's exerting more pressure because it's pushing that column of mercury away from itself and towards the unknown gas which is exerting less pressure. And the difference in the pressure that the two gases are exerting is 15 centimeters, which comes out to be 150 millimeters, our old metric conversion, 
take 150 millimeters of pressure divided by the number in an atmosphere, 760. That gives us 0.197 atmospheres. Remember, the air is exerting 0.197 more than the unknown gas, but that doesn't change the fact that the pressure of air at sea level is one atmosphere. So the unknown gas exerts 0.197 less, so it must be exerting 0.803 atmospheres of pressure. Any questions about those two? One atmosphere of pressure for air is a standard. The manometer is telling us how much more or less pressure the unknown gas is exerting compared to the air. So we can work out the pressure of the unknown gas itself. Okay, we're doing all right. Very quiet, very polite this morning. So, of course, in medicine, we're used to uh, using pressure uh, in medicine to make measurements. A uh, simplest example of that is just measuring, measuring blood pressure uh, for a patient and how easily they are pumping blood around the body. So we take the sphygmomanometer and the band is strapped around the patient's arm at the same height as their heart. And then we start pumping air in to the band to cut off the circulation of blood through the arm. And while listening with a stethoscope, as we release that pressure, we hear this whooshing sound, sometimes described as a knocking sound, that noise when the blood starts to flow through the artery again. That tells us the systolic pressure. That tells us the maximum pressure the heart is capable of mustering as it tries to push blood through the arteries. Then when that whooshing sound disappears, that's the blood flowing at a normal pressure um, through the veins and the arteries. And that gives us the diastolic pressure. That's a relative rest as the body and the heart pushes blood through the arteries. So it gives us two figures, systolic and diastolic pressure. And we have acceptable limits for both. I think the standard is still 120 and 80 millimeters of mercury pressure. If the systolic pressure is 120 or above, we consider the patient to have hypertension. And likewise, if their diastolic pressure is above 80, we consider them to be suffering from the early stages of hypertension. So there are drugs which are available to try and combat that hypertension. You've probably heard of drugs like propon, uh, I hate saying this, propanolol. There we go, propanolol. Let's say that five times fast. Of course, a continued hypertension and elevated levels of hypertension could lead to heart attacks or strokes. All right. How are we doing for time? Let's just take a quick break for five minutes and we'll let people go to the bathroom or get a drink. I'm just going to check on my daughter, make sure she is still a happy little bunny rabbit. All right. So for the rest of the chapter this week, we want to focus on, <coughs> excuse me, a last state of matter, gases and look at the gas laws which govern the gases. First of the laws we want to look at is Boyle's law, which looks at the relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume of a gas. So what Boyle discovered was that as the pressure increases, the volume of a gas normally decreases. And we can see that analogy when we look at a syringe, which is filled with air. Then we kind of close off the syringe tip or use our thumb to close it off and then push and pull on the syringe. As we pressurize, push down on that syringe, that increase in pressure decreases the volume. But if we start to pull the syringe out, uh, decrease the pressure, the volume increases. 
So it's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. If we take the pressure and multiply it by the volume using our standard units of atmospheres for the pressure and liters for the volume, that pressure multiplied by the volume always gives a constant value, mainly because you, if you double one, you're cutting the other factor in half to give the same value. Now, if there is a change forced onto the system and we produce this new pressure, P2, and this new volume, V2, multiplying that new pressure by the new volume will give you the same constant value. So the initial pressure and volume are equal to the constant, as are the adjusted or final pressure and volume, P2 and V2. So if they're equal to the same constant, we can say that the initial pressure, P1, and the initial volume, V1, are equal to the final pressure, P2, multiplied by the final volume, V2. And that gives us Boyle's law. Whoops, what did I do there? Something weird. P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. Now keep in mind that Boyle's law only works if we keep all other factors constant. So we have to keep the um, temperature of the gas constant. We have to keep the number of moles of gas constant. As long as we do that, then Boyle's law holds true. If we make a graph of the volume against changing pressure, as the pressure increases, we can see the volume decreasing. If we take the inverse of pressure, we can actually turn it into a straight line graph. That's something we'll be doing in the laboratory next week. So let's look at a couple of example problems before we leave Boyle's law. So to take a, a gas with a volume of four liters and with a measured pressure of 0.75 atmospheres, the volume is increased by enlarging the cylinder. The pressure changes and becomes 0.4 atmospheres. What would have happened to the volume? Remember Boyle's law is P1 V1 equal to P2 V2. And so the one thing we don't know, of course, is the, the volume V2. So we have to move pressure across the equals, the P2. As it moves across the equals, if it's a multiplier on one side, it becomes a divider on the other. So we get for volume V2, it's P1 times V1 divided by P2. We can plug in the values for the initial atmospheres. That was 0.75 for the pressure. The initial volume was four liters and the final pressure is 0.4 atmospheres. Those atmosphere units will cancel out and that comes to 7.5 liters for the volume. Second one. Our initial volume for the gas is now 0.5 liters. The pressure is recorded at four atmospheres. If the volume was decreased to just three liters, what would be the new pressure? Remember for Boyle's law to work, we have to keep the temperature constant and the number of moles of gas constant. It's gotta be a contained system, like say in a balloon. So for Boyle's law, we have P1 V1 equal to P2 V2. We want to know that final pressure P2 so when it's um, from the original equation, as it moves across, it's a multiplier and it's going to turn into a divider for the, I'm sorry, for the volume, I beg your pardon. There we go, because it's pressure what we want. So P1 times V1 uh, divided by V2. So we've got four atmospheres for the initial pressure, 0.5 liters for the initial volume and three liters for the final volume and those liter units will cancel out. And so that gives us a value of 0.667 atmospheres. Any questions about those two? We're doing all right. Most people enjoy 
well, maybe not go that far when you're talking about chemistry, but most people enjoy chapter seven. Certainly they enjoy their grade. It's usually amongst the highest grades of the semester when we look at the chapter seven exam. Now we are interested in monitoring a couple of gases in the body, primarily oxygen gas and carbon dioxide. Of course, we want to keep the oxygen concentrations high because your body and uh, organs use oxygen. But your body doesn't really have much use for carbon dioxide, aside from using a bit of carbon dioxide to regulate the pH of your blood plasma. But for the most part, that CO2 is unneeded and is breathed back out. It's actually easier to measure the concentration of gases by measuring the pressure that those gases exert. The pressure is directly related to the concentration of that gas. And so we want to keep the pressure of oxygen gas high and the pressure of carbon dioxide low. Interestingly, as the pressure of oxygen decreases, it normally signifies an increase in pressure for carbon dioxide. So as long as we can keep carbon dioxide pressure low, we know that oxygen pressure is high. Okay. We can also use Boyle's law to explain breathing in and out each day. So the diaphragm underneath your lungs contracts and moves down. And as it moves down, it expands the volume of the lungs. So as that diaphragm contracts, let's see, where's my pen? Where are you? There you are. Remember Boyle's law. So as the volume increases, to keep it equal to that constant, the pressure must be decreasing inside the lungs. So the pressure of air in the lungs is lower than the pressure of air in the surrounding room. And so you naturally breathe in for the nose and mouth, air moves in to the lungs. Two bodies of gas at different pressures, which are exposed to each other, they want to equalize. So high pressure always moves to low pressure. Of course, eventually, a couple of seconds later, the diaphragm will uh, relax and move back up. As it moves back up, that volume of the lungs decreases. And for Boyle's law to hold true and be equal to that same constant each time, as the volume decreases, the pressure must be increasing. So now the pressure of air inside the lungs is higher than the surrounding room and you naturally breathe out through your nose and mouth. So Boyle's law very nicely explains breathing in and out. Remember, you should always use atmospheres for the pressure of a gas as a standard. It just has everybody on the same page using the same units. So if you have got a, a measurement of pressure in millimeters of mercury or tor, just divide by 760 to turn into atmospheric pressure. Uh, for temperature, as we'll see in a moment, some of our equations uh, take a measurement of the temperature of the gas. And the temperature of the gas should be given in Kelvin. So if you have a value in degrees Celsius, add 273 to that Celsius value to convert it into Kelvin. Even if the question wants you to give your final answer in Celsius, convert into Kelvin to calculate your answer. If you try and calculate your answers for Charles' law and Guy Lussac's law using temperature in Celsius, you will get the wrong answer. So you must convert into standard units. In particular, convert into standard units for temperature. 
All right, so that was the uh, first one, Boyle's Law. Remember that Boyle's Law only works if we're keeping all other parameters constant. So the next one we want to look at is the relationship between volume and temperature. And this is what we call Charles' Law. You think about our body of gas, whatever volume it has, and if you increase the temperature of the gas, warm it up, those molecules have more kinetic energy. Molecules with more kinetic energy move faster and spread out further. So as temperature increases, the volume of a gas increases. Conversely, if you drop temperature, molecules have less kinetic energy, they're moving more slowly. The molecules which move more slowly um, take up less room. And so the volume of the gas decreases with decreasing temperature. And this is Charles' law. And so it tells us that the volume in liters divided by the temperature in Kelvin is equal to a constant. Now, if there is a change forced on the system, that new volume, V2, divided by the new temperature, T2, will still be equal to the same constant. So V1 divided by T1 and V2 divided by T2 are equal to the same constant. So they're equal to each other. And so for Charles' law, we can say that V1 divided by T1 is equal to V2 divided by T2. And it's a linear relationship as temperature increases, the volume of the gas increases. But just like Boyle's law, Charles' law only holds true if we keep all other factors constant. So for Charles' law, we're keeping the moles of gas constant, and we're also keeping the pressure of the gas constant. Let's look at some examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, oh, get back here. So our volume of gas, 4.5 liters at a temperature of 42, uh, sorry, 40 degrees Celsius. <coughs> Excuse me. If the gas is heated up to a new temperature of 60 degrees, what would the new final volume V2 become? So of course, before we start, we've got to do our conversions. Temperature must be in Kelvin by adding 273 units. That's the difference between the Celsius and the Kelvin scale. So we've got 313 for the initial Kelvin temperature and 333 for the final temperature in Kelvin. Now we're ready for our calculation. So we've got V1, that was 4.5 liters. We have got T1, that's 313 Kelvin. We want to work out V2, the final volume, and we've got T2, 333 Kelvin. There'll only be one factor that you don't know. So again, rearranging our equation to make that final volume the subject, we've got to move T2 across. Now it's dividing on one side. So as it moves across the equals, it becomes a multiplier on the other. So we get V1 multiplied by T2 divided by T1. We can plug in our values. The Kelvin units will cancel out across the divider. And so we get a volume of 4.79 liters for the final T2, eh, sorry, V2. Second one. 600 milliliters of a gas at a temperature of 55 degrees. If the volume expanded to 1500 milliliters, what happened to the te temperature? And give your final answer in degrees Celsius. So a couple of conversions this time, 600 milliliters becomes 0. 0.6 liters. 1500 milliliters becomes 1.5 liters. 1000 milliliters to make a liter, of course. And then for our temperature, 55 degrees, add 273 to make it 328 Kelvin. Even if the final answer is desired in Celsius, 
convert into Kelvin. So V1 divided by T1 equal to V2 divided by T2. We want the final temperature T2 this time. So we want to get T2 on its own, but it's also got to be on the top half of the fraction. So we're going to move T2 up to the left. It's dividing, so it's going to become a multiplier. We need to move then V1 and T1 across. So T1, which is a divider, becomes a multiplier on the top with V2. V1, which is on top, moves across to the bottom. So we get T2 is equal to V2 times T1 divided by V1. We plug in our values that we have for the question. The litre units will cancel out. And so we get Kelvin units, 820 Kelvin. We can subtract 273 to give us a Celsius equivalent, 547 degrees Celsius. Okay, everybody's very quiet. A couple of last things to mention. Oh, actually, we're going on to Guy Sachs Law. So remember, Charles Law only works if we keep the moles of gas constant and we keep the pressure of gas constant. Every gas law that we're looking at looks at two factors which it can vary and keeps the other factors constant. That's probably a good point to stop. Let's see, page 282 next. And so then that would give us, to finish off, oh, just five or six pages left to do. Looking at two more gas laws, Avogadro's law and Guy Lussac's law. And we'll start with Lussac's law on Friday. Any questions before we finish?